This presentation is a part of Audio Adventure Theater. CTD Productions presents to you The Devoted Friend based on the short story by Oscar Wilde starring Samuel Shipp as Mr. Lennett Chase Kinney as Hugh the Miller and Bradley Van Loo as Little Hans Good morning, Mrs. Duck Good morning, Mr. Water Rat Good morning, my dear Water Rat Oh, Hello, Mr. Linnet, you little bird. I may be little, but I have a song that travels far. Ah, yes. Uh, Mrs. Duck, your little ducklings look like a lot of yellow canaries swimming around in the pond. Yes, they do indeed. I'm trying to teach them how to stand on their heads in the water. Do we have to, Mother? Yes, Mother, do we have to? You will never be in the best society unless you can stand on your heads. What good is it to be in society at all? What is society? What's disobedient children? They really deserve to be drowned. Nothing of the kind. Everyone must make a beginning. And parents cannot be too patient. Indeed. Ah, I know nothing about the feelings of parents. I am not a family man. In fact, I have never been married and I never intend to be. Love is all very well in its way, but friendship is much higher. Indeed, I know of nothing in the world that is either nobler or rarer than a devoted friendship. <laughs> and what, pray, is your idea of the duties of a devoted friend, my dear water rat? Yes, that is just what I want to know. Oh, what a silly question. I should expect my devoted friend to be devoted to me, of course. And what would you do in return? I don't understand you. Let me tell you a story on the subject. Oh, well, if you're going to be telling stories, it'll probably distract my ducklings from their practice. So if you could be so kind as to excuse us... Goodbye, Mrs. Duck. <laughs> now then, Mr. Linnet, is this story of yours about me? If so, I will listen to it, for I am extremely fond of fiction. It is applicable to you. What is the story called? I call it The Story of the Devoted Friend. An interesting title, to be sure. Once upon a time, there was an honest little fellow named Hans. Was he very distinguished? No, I don't think he was distinguished at all, except for his kind heart and his funny, round, good-humored face. He lived in a tiny cottage all by himself, and every day he worked in his garden. In all the countryside, there was no garden so lovely as his. Little Hans had a great many friends, but the most devoted friend of all was Big Hugh the Miller. Indeed, so devoted was the rich Miller to Little Hans that he would never go by his garden without leaning over the wall and plucking a large handful of sweet herbs, or filling his pocket with plums and cherries if it was the fruit season. My dear Hans, I believe that real friends should have everything in common. That is true! How fortunate am I to have a friend with such noble ideas. Sometimes, indeed, the neighbors thought it strange that the rich miller never gave little Hans anything in return. Though he had a hundred sacks of flour stored away in his mill, and six milk cows, and a large flock of woolly sheep. But Hans never troubled his head about these things, and nothing gave him greater pleasure than to listen to all the wonderful things the miller used to say about the unselfishness of true friendship. <sighs> so little Hans worked away in his garden. During the spring, the summer, and the autumn, he was very happy. But when the winter came, and he had no fruit or flowers to bring to the market, he suffered a good deal from the cold and hunger, and often had to go to bed without any supper but a few dried pears or some hard nuts. Also, in the winter, he was extremely lonely, as the miller never came to see him then. My dear wife, there is no good in my going to see little Hans as long as the snow lasts. For when people are in trouble, they should be left alone and not be bothered by visitors. That at least is my idea about friendship, and I am sure I am right. 
So I shall wait till the spring comes, and then I shall pay him a visit, and he will be able to give me a large basket of primroses, and that will make him so happy. Husband, you are certainly very thoughtful about others. <laughs> very thoughtful indeed. It is quite a treat to hear you talk about friendship. I'm sure the clergyman himself could not say such beautiful things as you do, though he does live in a three-storied house and wear a gold ring on his little finger. But could we not ask little Hands up here? If poor Hands is in trouble, I'll give him half my porridge and show him my white rabbits. What a silly boy you are. I really don't know what is the use of sending you to school, son. You seem not to learn anything. Why, if little Hans came up here and saw our warm fire and our good supper, he might get envious. And envy is a most terrible thing. It would spoil anybody's nature. I certainly will not allow Hans' nature to be spoiled. I am his best friend and I will always watch over him and see that he is not led into any temptations. Besides, if Hans came here, he might ask me to let him have some flour on credit. And that I could not do. Flower is one thing, and friendship is another, and they should not be confused. Why? The words are spelt differently, and mean quite different things. Everybody can see that. How well you talk! Really, I feel quite drowsy. It is just like being in church. Lots of people act well, but very few people talk well, which shows that talking is much the more difficult thing of the two, and much the finer thing also. And then the miller looked sternly across the table at his little son, who felt so ashamed of himself that he hung his head down and grew quite scarlet and began to cry into his tea. However, he was so young that you must excuse him. Is that the end of the story? Certainly not. That is the beginning. Then you are quite behind the age. Every good storyteller nowadays starts with the end, and then goes on to the beginning and concludes with the middle. That is the new method. I heard all about it the other day from a critic who was walking round the pond with a young man. He spoke of the matter at great length, and I am sure he must have been right, for he had blue spectacles and a bald head. And whenever the young man made any remark, he always answered, Pill. But pray go on with your story. I like the miller immensely. I have all kinds of beautiful sentiments myself, so there was a great sympathy between us. Well, as soon as the winter was over and the primroses began to open their pale yellow stars, the miller said to his wife, Wife, I must go down and see little Hans. Why, what a good heart you have, husband. You are always thinking of others. And mind you take the big basket with you for the flowers. So the miller tied the sails of the windmill together with a strong iron chain and went down the hill with the basket on his arm. Good morning, little Hans. Good morning. And how have you been all the winter? Well, really, it is very good of you to ask. Very good indeed. I'm afraid I had a rather hard time of it. But now the spring has come, and I am quite happy, and all my flowers are doing well. We often talked of you during the winter, Hans and wondered how you were getting on. That was kind of you. I was half afraid you had forgotten me. Hans, I'm surprised at you. Friendship never forgets. That is the wonderful thing about it. But I'm afraid you don't understand the poetry of life. How lovely your primroses are looking, by the by. They are certainly very lovely, and it is a most lucky thing for me that I have so many. I'm going to bring them into the market and sell them to the Burgomaster's daughter and buy back my wheelbarrow with the money. Buy back your wheelbarrow? You don't mean to say you have sold it? What a very unintelligent thing to do. Well, th the fact is, I was obliged to. You see, the winter was a very bad time for me, and I really had no money at all to buy bread with. So I first sold the silver buttons off my Sunday coat, and then I sold my silver chain, and at last, I sold my wheelbarrow. But I'm going to buy them all back again now. Hans. I will give you my wheelbarrow. It is not in very good repair. Indeed, one side is gone, and there is something wrong with the wheel spokes. But in spite of that, I will give it to you. I know it is very generous of me, and a great many people would think me extremely foolish for parting with it, but I am not like the rest of the world. I think that generosity is the essence of friendship. And besides, I have got a new wheelbarrow for myself. 
Yes, you may set your mind at ease. I will give you my wheelbarrow. Well, really, that is generous of you. I can easily put it in repair, as I have a plank of wood in my house. A plank of wood? Why, that is just what I want for the roof of my barn. There is a very large hole in it, and the corn will all get damp if I don't stop it up. How lucky you mentioned it. It is quite remarkable how one good action always breeds another. I have given you my wheelbarrow, and now you are going to give me your plank. Of course, the wheelbarrow is worth far more than the plank, but true friendship never notices things like that. Pray get it at once, and I will set to work at my barn this very day. It's just in the shed here. Here, here it is, friend. It is not a very big plank, and I'm afraid that after I've mended my barn roof, there won't be any left for you to mend the wheelbarrow with, but, of course, that is not my fault. And now, as I have given you my wheelbarrow, I am sure you would like to give me some flowers in return. Here is the basket. And, and mind you, fill it quite full. Quite full? It is really a very big basket. And if I fill it, there will be no flowers left for me to take to the market. And I would very much like to get my silver buttons back. Well, really? As I have given you my wheelbarrow? I don't think that it is much to ask of you for a few flowers. I may be wrong, but I should have thought that friendship, true friendship, was quite free from selfishness of any kind. My dear friend, my best friend, you're welcome to all the flowers in my garden. I would much sooner have your good opinion than my silver buttons any day. And little Hans ran and plucked all his primroses and filled the miller's basket. Goodbye, little Hans. Goodbye. The next day, he was nailing up some honeysuckle against the porch when he heard the miller's voice Hans! calling to him from the road. Hans! So he jumped off the ladder and ran down the garden and looked over the wall. There was the miller with a large sack of flour on his back. D dear little Hans, would you mind carrying this sack of flour for me to the market? <clears throat> oh, I am so sorry, but I'm really very busy today. I've got all my creepers to nail up, and all my flowers to water, and all my grass to roll up. Well, really? I think that considering that I am going to give you my wheelbarrow, it is rather unfriendly of you to refuse. Oh, don't say that! I wouldn't be unfriendly for the whole world. I'll just go and get my cap. And then I'll take it for you. It was a very hot day, and the road was terribly dusty. And before Hans had reached the sixth milestone, he was so tired that he had to sit down and rest. However, he went on bravely, and at last he reached the market. After he had waited there some time, he sold the sack of flour for a very good price. And then he returned home at once, for he was afraid that if he stopped too late, he might meet some robbers on the way. It has certainly been a hard day, but I am glad I did not refuse the miller, for he is my best friend. And besides, he is going to give me his wheelbarrow. Early the next morning, the miller came down to get his money for the sack of flour. But little Hans was so tired that he was still in bed. Oh. Upon my word, you are very lazy. Really, considering that I am giving you my wheelbarrow, I think you might work harder. Idleness is a great sin, and I certainly don't like any of my friends to be idle or sluggish. You must not mind my speaking quite plainly to you. Of course, I should not dream of doing so if I were not your friend. But what is the good of friendship if one cannot say exactly what one means? Anybody can say charming things or try to please and to flatter. But a true friend always says unpleasant things and does not mind giving pain. Indeed, if he is a really true friend, he prefers it, for he knows that then he is doing good. I am very sorry, but I was so tired that I thought I would lay in bed for a little time and listen to the birds singing. Do you know that I always work better after hearing the birds sing? Well, I am glad of that, Ooh. for I want you to come up to the mill as soon as you are dressed and mend my barn roof for me. 
poor little Hans was very anxious to go and work in his garden, for his flowers had not been watered for two days. But he did not like to refuse the miller, as he was such a good friend to him. Do you think it would be unfriendly of me if I said I was busy? Well, really, I do not think it is much to ask of you, considering that I am going to give you my wheelbarrow. But of course, if you refuse, I will go and do it myself. Oh, on no account! So little Hans jumped out of bed and dressed himself and went up to the barn. He worked there all day long till sunset. And at sunset, the miller came to see how he was getting on. Have you mended the hole in the roof yet, little Hans? It is quite mended. Ah! There is no work so delightful as the work one does for others. <laughs> it is certainly a great privilege to hear you talk. A very great privilege. But I'm afraid I shall never have such beautiful ideas as you have. Oh, they will come to you, but you must take more pains. At the present, you only have the practice of friendship. Someday you will have the theory also. Do you really think I shall? I have no doubt of it. But now that you have mended the roof, you had better go home and rest. For I want you to drive my sheep to the mountain tomorrow. But... Poor little Hans was afraid to say anything to this. <sighs> and early the next morning, the miller brought morning, his sheep round to the cottage, and Hans started off with them to the mountain. It took him the whole day to get there and back. And when he returned, he was so tired that he went off to sleep in his chair and did not wake up till it was broad daylight. <clears throat> what a delightful time I shall have in my garden. But somehow he was never able to look after his flowers at all, for his friend, the miller, was always coming round and sending him off on long errands or getting him to help at the mill. Little Hans was very much distressed at times, as he was afraid his flowers would think he had forgotten them. But he consoled himself by the reflection that the miller was his best friend. Besides, he is going to give me his wheelbarrow. That is an act of pure generosity. So little Hans worked away for the miller, and the miller said all kinds of beautiful things about friendship, which Hans took down in a notebook and used to read over at night, for he was a very good scholar. Now it happened that one evening little Hans was sitting by his fireside when a loud rap came at the door. It was a very wild night, and the wind was blowing and roaring round the house so terribly that at first he thought it was merely the storm. But a second rap came, and then a third, louder than any of the others. It is some poor traveler. <clears throat> Why, my dear friend, what are you doing over here on a night like this? Dear little Hans, I am in great trouble. My little boy has fallen off a ladder and hurt himself, and I'm going for the doctor. But he lives so far away, and it's such a bad night, that it has just occurred to me that it would be much better if you went instead of me. You know I'm going to give you my wheelbarrow, and so it is only fair that you should do something for me in return. Certainly. I take it quite as a compliment. You're coming to me, and I will start off at once. But you must lend me your lantern as the night is so dark that I'm afraid I might fall into the ditch. I am very sorry, but it is my new lantern, and it would be a great loss to me if anything happened to it. Well, never mind. I will do without it. And so little Hans took down his great fur coat and his warm scarlet cap and tied a muffler round his throat and started off. What a dreadful storm it was! The night was so black that little Hans could hardly see, and the wind was so strong that he could scarcely stand. However, he was very courageous, and after he had been walking about three hours, he arrived at the doctor's house and knocked at the door. Hello, doctor! Who is that? Little Hans, doctor! What do you want, little Hans? The miller's son has fallen from a ladder and has hurt himself, and the miller wants you to come at once. All right, I'll be done in a minute. 
and the doctor ordered his horse and his big boots and his lantern and came downstairs and rode off in the direction of the miller's house, little Hans trudging behind him. But the storm grew worse and worse, and the rain fell in torrents, and little Hans could not see where he was going or keep up with the horse. At last he lost his way and wandered off on the moor, which was a very dangerous place as it was full of deep holes. And there, poor little Hans was drowned. His body was found the next day by some goat herds, floating in a great pool of water, and was brought back by them to the cottage. Everybody went to little Han's funeral, as he was so popular, and the miller was the chief mourner. As I was his best friend, it is only fair that I should have the best place. So he walked at the head of the procession in a long black cloak, and every now and then he wiped his eyes with a big pocket handkerchief. Little Hans is certainly a great loss to everyone, Hugh. A great loss to me, at any rate. Yeah. Why, I had as good as given him my wheelbarrow. And now I really don't know what to do with it. Yep. It is very much in my way at home. Mm. It is in such bad repair that I could not get anything for it if I sold it. I know. <laughs> I will certainly take care not, not to give away anything, anything again. again. One, One always, always suffers, suffers for being generous. Well? Well, that is the end. But what became of the miller? Oh, I really don't know. And I am sure that I don't care. It is quite evident then that you have no sympathy in your nature. I'm afraid you don't quite see the moral of the story. The what? The moral. Do you mean to say that the story has a moral? Certainly. Well, really, I think you should have told me that before you began. If you had done so, I certainly would not have listened to you. In fact, I should have said Poe, like the critic. However, I can say it now. Poe! Good day to you, twittering little bird. <sighs> and how did you like the water rat? He has a great many good points. But for my own part, I have a mother's feelings. And I can never look at a confirmed bachelor without the tears coming into my eyes. I am rather afraid that I have annoyed him. The fact is that I told him a story with a moral. Ah, that is always a very dangerous thing to do. I quite agree with you. In The Devoted Friend by Oscar Wilde, traumatized for audio by Caleb Thiessen, you heard Samuel Ship as Mr. Lennon. Chase Kinney as Hugh the Miller, Bradley Van Loo as Little Hans, Jesse Madrano was the Water Rat, and Janet Harding as Mother Duck. Other parts were played by Hannah Thiessen, Francis Aspiris, Zoe Coronidas, Justin Heath, Aaron Thiessen, and Lucas Carding. The program was produced by Caleb Thiessen. The audio adventure theater theme was composed by Garrett Vandenberg, and I am Levi Stoller. The Devoted Friend by Oscar Wilde was brought to you by CTD Productions. Be sure to check out our website at audioadventuretheater.blogspot.com.